I always knew I had a knack for leadership. I just didn't know where I would end up. And so I knew that if I took my leadership experience that I've gotten in the Army, leading a diverse group of people, coupled with the business acumen of the MBA program, that would make me a successful leader in corporate America. So how did your expectations of the MBA compare to what you actually experienced? So my biggest challenge was really balancing academics, home life, internship, and also to get, you know, going from leading people to leading a service center, looking at marketing and strategy. And I think the MBA really helped me prepare for being agile and learning businesses and, and solving problems quickly. One is, I believe it enhanced my career opportunities. The second thing that the MBA afforded me, and this is what I would say no matter which school you go to, it's all about your network. Your network is equal to your network. And then lastly, this entrepreneurial spirit. What I would say is that life is not linear because there will be some pitfalls and the pitfalls is where your learnings come from and those learnings make you a better person or a better reader. So Angelo Adams is the president of Zipcar. He's had a long and diverse career. He spent almost 12 years as a leader at Otis Elevator Company, as a brand manager at Johnson & Johnson, and an officer in the U.S. Army. He's a graduate of West Point and the Ross School of Business. He served on two Congressional Service nomination boards and was selected as a contestant on Oprah's Big Give reality TV show. Hey, Sujan, good to talk to you again. Thanks for having me. It's been many years since you've been in Ann Arbor. Want to hear your story from start to finish. So I want to go way back to your days at West Point. You were just graduating. What was your first job out of college? Well, since I went to West Point, my first job out of college was obviously the, the military. Um, had to get five years of service back to the military. Um, and so it was really mission driven, uh, leading soldiers in, in combat. I actually went to uh, OIF, op, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, with the 82nd Airborne Division, but really my first job in the Army was a platoon leader. And what this is, is, uh, you know, basically I came in and I was in charge of 40, 40 soldiers, 40 paratroopers. I was 23 years old and they put me in charge of 40 people. So, uh, it, it taught me a lot about, about leadership. Uh, one of the first lessons is that even though I was very new to my job, like everybody else in the platoon had more experience than me. And my platoon sergeant uh, had about 15 years in the army. So technically, I was the uh, I was the one in charge. But really, I had to. Uh, they taught me a lot, and I had to learn from them and leading indirectly through my uh, through my team. So, what was that like being more junior than a lot of the people that you were leading? How did you gain cred credibility and feel like you could? lead these more experienced people yeah a, a lot of it is about um about team building and becoming part of the team and, and driving a, a similar culture together uh the second thing i would say is i don't have all the right ideas whether i was a platoon leader whether i'm a a, a leader in corporate america all, i don't have to have all the ideas uh, so what i did was i listened to my, my my platoon sergeant i listened to my my squad leaders and as they came up with suggestions on things that we could do, I figured out how to incorporate those suggestions into the problems that we were trying to solve. And then I, I made sure I gave them credit and gave them feedback uh, to, to the larger audience, the larger platoon about like, what did I use from what they gave me in order to solve the problem? And so what that did was that actually provided more credibility to me. People wanted to make sure uh, that they present me with ideas because they knew that there was a chance that I can implement some of those ideas. Probably a good chance, a healthy chance, since uh, since I was fresh out of the uh, out of school. Military experience is really great for business school, as you found and as we found on the other side. That military folks come in with a lot of leadership and a lot of lived experience, and so you were a great candidate for the MBA program. So, what did you think when you were in your twenty something? years that you would do when you grew up and got out of the military? Well, Susan, well, first of all, thank you because, uh, uh, you know, you were instrumental in helping to get me into Ross and probably, I don't know if you read my file, but I'm sure you were, you, you saw my file amongst many. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I would say going back to my 20 year old self, I always knew I had a, a knack for leadership. Uh, I just didn't know where I would end up, but in high school, I played multiple sports. Um, I was uh, I was a three sport varsity athlete. I was a team captain on football and track. Uh, I also probably the first big leadership assignment for me in high school was uh, I was in junior ROTC. So it was like an ROTC program for high school students. 
And at my school, I was the battalion commander. And so they, they used to give me the nickname General Adams because <laughs> I was I was the one the one sort of in charge. And uh, I think that was what really led me to West Point is just being able to lead this group of basically a group of peers. And so um, that my leadership experience really started early. And then I went to West Point and West Point is the premier leadership institution in the world. And so it's nothing like kind of being this rock star uh, in high school, you know, three sport athlete, you know, state championships. Um, and then showing up one day one at West Point, they strip you of all of that. And you start out as a plea. <laughs> you start out as a plea. So, uh, I mean, it was a, it was a humbling experience, but it was truly a leadership journey. And, uh, and I think West Point prepared me to be a, a leader in corporate America. And it all started when I was young, uh, in high school. And so I, I think I knew I wanted to be a leader. I just didn't know the path in which I would end up. So at that point when you were in high school, you weren't crystal clear whether you wanted to work in business or be in the military for your entire career. You thought it could be anything, but leadership is the lane that I want to be in. That's correct. So what made it motivated you to want to get an MBA? So my first decision around getting an MBA was whether or not to stay in the army or get, or get out the army. And given that I really valued family and I valued being able to raise a family, um, my first five years in the army, I was actually, uh, I was actually away from my family 40% of the time. So I spent a year in Iraq and a year in Korea. So I had to really think hard about whether or not I wanted to consistently be, um, away from my family. And, and that led me to, okay, I want to get out of the army. So then what next? Well, I knew I had this great leadership experience from the military, um, and from the army. And so I was like, I need to, I needed the MBA to really, hone on my business acumen. And so I knew that if I took my leadership experience, or at least back then, I thought that if I took my leadership experience that I've gotten in the army in leading people, leading a diverse group of people, coupled with the business acumen of the MBA program, that would make me a successful leader in corporate America. And ultimately, my goal is to one day be a, a, um, a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And so I had to start out somewhere and learning the business basics was a gap that I needed to fill. And I would say to me, Ross was, uh, was the, was a good program in order to, a great program in order to start out in because not only do you have the case study me method in the classroom, but we also had the map program. So it's multi action, multi disciplinary action program. And what that did was that really took that leadership experience that I got in the army coupled with the case studies and the business studies in the classroom. And I actually got to apply that. Um, in Brazil, when I was down in South America, I went on my map project and was able to apply it to a local plastics company. When you were in the military, how did you even, how did an MBA even get into your mind? Because for a lot of folks in the military, what they know is the military. And unless you have a mentor or a role model, for a lot of people, whether you're military or not, they don't even know what an MBA can do for you. So how did that even enter your mind? Yeah, it's just like you said, I had, I had mentors and role models. And believe it or not, um, particularly West Pointers, probably 75 to 80 percent of West Pointers go on and get some type of advanced degree. Right. And so there were there were many people in my circle that were going to get an MBA. Uh, there were also mentors of mine who have gotten MBAs. And so I was able to talk to them through the process. And so prior to getting my MBA, I was in a program called Management Leadership for Tomorrow, MLT. And so I really spent 18 years studying um, networking and studying for my GMAT and understanding like what does it take to get into business school. So the, my my um my mentors coupled with my time at MLT really kind of set me on a trajectory to go get my MBA. Did you have any family members who had an MBA? I did not. No family members. In fact, I was the first college graduate in my family. Um, and I mean now we've got several, but I was the first one. So I didn't really have anybody in my family that I can reach out to. So it was important for me to talk to my mentors uh, that I had met in the army. So your first generation college, it's so notable because we're gonna get to your kids shortly. Your kids are just rocking it. You guys will be amazed that. at everything that they've achieved. His Thank kids you. are amazing. <laughs> but let's, let's stay on this track of you and the MBA. How did the actual experience differ from what you expected? Did you expect MBA to be hardcore competitive or did you expect it to be something else did you expect that it would be super hard because you didn't major in a quant area or maybe you did or i don't know if you had expectations that were different from 
what it actually was. If they were similar, then I won't answer, ask that question. Yeah, because I like mine was similar because I I had done MLT, I you know mentor, so mine was really similar. Yeah, so yeah, I, I kind of okay. knew. What is a challenge that you faced while you were in business school? So I think for me, my biggest challenge is that I was in business school, married with two children, and so it was this being able to balance both school and group projects and summer internships. And, and really it was, uh, you know, think about the MBA experience being a challenging one and then couple on that, that you have a family and two kids to raise. Uh, and what I found was that it was a really supporting environment, a supporting, I had a village. And so my kids were part of that village and they, you know, I had, um, classmates that would say, Hey, bring your kids, you know, or, um, my kids was actually in, they were in the Ross Follies, which is like a, uh, like a business school play toward the end of business school. And so they got a chance to go to football games. They got a chance to go to tailgates. Uh, but they also got a chance to have their own little mini Ross experience as part of Ross kids. And, uh, so my biggest challenge was really balancing academics, home life, internship, and also two kids. And you managed it and managed it very well. I don't know about well, but I, I, uh, I got through it. <laughs> You built a great foundation because let me tell you, tell them about your kids, Angelo. Where are they now? And what All are right, they doing? So, um, so my kids, uh, so I've got two kids, um, Jasmine, and Isaiah, uh, Jasmine was born at, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Isaiah was born at West Point. Um, and like Sujan mentioned earlier, I'm first generation, um, college, college grad. And, uh, you know, now and years later, both of my kids are now, uh, at Harvard University. So my daughter, She's graduating in May, so looking forward to that, getting a chance to go up there and, and see a Harvard graduation. She's also getting commissioned as an Air Force officer, so uh, she'll be getting stationed out in Ohio. Um, so that's coming up. And then my son is a freshman at Harvard, uh, a wrestler. He's in, uh, he's in Army ROTC, and uh, so he's just kind of getting started, but he's had a very successful uh, first semester. I'm hearing the second semester is going just as well. And uh, and soon he will be uh, interning this summer in D.C. So looking forward to hearing about his summer experience. That is amazing. From first generation college to two kids at Harvard, you and I had chatted about you must be a tiger dad. And you were like, what's a tiger dad? And so I told you about what a tiger mom is in Asian culture. You know, the one who says you got to do this, this and this and you got to go achieve. And so what did you tell me that you were not a tiger dad, but a... I was, they, they would say I was a drill sergeant, right? They would say, dad, in fact, I was with my son last night. Yesterday was his birthday. And so we were up in Cambridge and, um, and he had talked about, you know, he had another group that, that was there with us. And he had told them, I guess, before that, hey, my dad wouldn't even let us go outside until I did coding or I did SAT prep. And I was like, yeah, if you want to go out and have fun, then you have to do something to advance you in your academics. And so... You know, they they thought it was a haze, but I, I just know it was building the fundamentals you need in order to be successful. They're lucky and they did great. And you did great as a parent. Oh, thank yeah. you. And likewise, likewise to you, Susan. Thank you very much. I feel like that's one of the most important jobs a parent has. It's not just the career that you have, but also raising good human beings. And you have done that, Angelo. Congratulations. Thank you. So walk me through your journey to your current role. I mentioned your career progression. How did you get each role and what did you learn about getting those roles? Yeah, so, you know, my, my career didn't start out as some laid out plan, you know, with directions here and there. Um, it really was all over the map. You know, I graduated from West Point, um, commissioned as an Army officer. Uh, I went to the 82nd Airborne Division. Let me tell you, I never wanted to jump out of airplanes. Um, so I was <laughs> voluntold. I was voluntold that I had to <laughs> jump out of airplanes. And as part of my um, assignment to the 82nd, we actually went to Iraq and uh, had a tour of duty in Iraq um, with the 82nd Airborne Division. And then after I got from Iraq, um, I actually went to West Point admissions and did uh, recruiting in the Southeast region for West Point. Uh, and then I, I finished up in the Army in and, and Seoul, Korea. So I spent a year on a Korean base um, as a liaison between the U.S. Army and the Korean Army. Uh, and so from there, we talked about my business school uh, experience a little bit, but I graduated from Ross and then I landed my first corporate job. My first corporate job was at, uh, was at J and J managing, um, I was a, a, associate brand manager on Johnson's baby bath, lotion and shampoo. 
And so I like to say I went from like shooting at people to uh, to, to selling baby products. <laughs> but um, I, so I moved and then so from there I was like, hey, I need something. You know, I'm a hands on leader. I like to lead teams. And so I, I wanted something more operational. And so I went over to then um, to Otis Elevator, where I started out as a service manager for Otis Elevator. And I spent really 12 years at Otis, really going from a service manager all the way up to an executive at Otis Elevator. So at Otis in Philadelphia, I started as a service manager. And then I actually got my first GM assignment, um, general manager assignment in Allentown in Harrisburg office. Was there for a couple of years, and then they brought me back to Philly to lead um, the Philadelphia office, which was the largest GBO um, for Otis Elevator. We had about 52 or 5,300 units. Uh, and then from there, I, I was there a year, was successful in that role, and they I got promoted to uh, to New England. And so I was a New England regional general manager for Otis Elevator, where I led five different GBOs. So basically, think about New York City North. Um, and I had two second brands, Otis consider them second brands, off brands that Otis had purchased. And then I, uh, I did two years there and I went to run a service center. So service center is all of our engineers. It was our uh, digital tech hub. It was the call center. So just think about all of these experiences. Uh, like these are all different for me. It's all different. So I found myself like, you know, going from leading people to leading a service center to, you know, um, looking at marketing and strategy. And I think the MBA really helped me prepare for being agile and learning businesses and, and solving problems quickly. Um, and so I think that helped me to progress within Otis. I want to go back to your baby care brand managing role. So talk to me about what brand management is for, for people out there who may not know what that involves. And after that, Talk to me about how it felt going from jumping out of airplanes for the military to working on a baby product. So when I went to uh, when I went to go work for uh, this consumer package against company, uh, marketing associate brand manager is really, you know, they would describe it as the hub of the wheel. Right. And so the focus of your pro the focus of what you're doing is driving a product, driving innovation. And as a brand manager, as an associate brand manager, you're not really in charge of anybody, but you're in charge of the process for getting that product to market. So you may meet with your finance person, and talk about pricing, talk about strategies on, you know, uh, do we run promotions? You might meet with your legal person and talk about, you know, what can you have on packaging? What can you say? What can you not say? You might talk to your operation folks um, that are at Target, at Walmart, at some of your big brand retailers. And, you know, have different conversations around how to promote it. What is the customer looking for? And then lastly, you know, it all starts with the consumer, right? And the, and, and the person is actually, you know, using your product, in this case, using our baby product. And, and we would run focus groups. And so, you know, typically the focus group is led by a professional, but back behind the scenes, you know, in preparation to, of the focus group and also behind the scenes of the conversation is the associate brand manager making sure that the right questions get asked. And so you're really like, you're really like an uh, an orchestra, a conductor, like tying all the music together. And I, that's, what, that's how I would describe an associate brand manager. So that sounds like fun work. What made you leave that to go to Otis? So again, I talked about it being the hub of the real wheel and you're not in charge of anything, but you're managing like the different processes. And for me, like I, I was in a cubicle at a computer doing all sorts of analysis, kind of like by myself, right? And so I kind of felt like I was a plebe again. And it was like, <laughs> okay, like, what the heck am I doing here? You know, prior to this, prior to, you know, my experience um, in, in the CPG world, I was leading large organizations. I led 180 paratroopers in Iraq. Um, now I was buttoned up really every single day of the week, speaking as marketing jargon and um, like at this big bohemian company. And, and for me, I felt myself like, like some, some would call it code switching, right? It was like trying to be something that you're not. And if, if you know me, right, if you know me, you know I'm a people person, you know I'm a leader. And so I felt like, oh my gosh, I need to find something that I can do and lead people and solve problems. And so I took the risk and I left the path that I had, that most of my peers were on coming out of business school. You know, business school in some cases, it's like a herd. You're like, I'm in finance, I'm in marketing, and, and those companies are coming to business school. And so I was, I followed the herd initially and went into, and went into marketing, went into CPG. Um, but I, I had to take the risk and say, Hey, that's not for me. So I leaned on my military network and said, Hey, 
what are operational roles out there that I could do um, and still use my MBA? And so that's how I landed at Otis Elevator. Okay. So do you feel like the MBA was worth it? So I'm 16 years out of my MBA. I definitely feel like the MBA was worth it um, for many of reasons. One is I believe it enhanced my career opportunities. You know, most operational leaders stay on the operations track. But through my MBA, I was able to navigate from ops, you know, more general management, run a service center, and now even switch industries and go from, uh, I went from baby products to elevators, and now I'm in cars, right? So the MBA has allowed me to really be agile to transition in industries, but also transition in jobs and hit the ground running. I think the second thing that the MBA afforded me, and this is what I would say, no matter what school you go to, it's all about your network. Your network is equal to your net worth, right? And so the MBA allowed me to be able to pick up the phone and talk to people, smart people about what to do next. Um, how do I handle certain challenges in my job? Again, I'm the first one in my family that's actually had a corporate role. And so I don't have a lot of family members that I can reach out to and say, how would you handle this? But the MBA gave me a network of people that I can reach out to both, you know, both above me, you know, my peers. Um, and then also, there's also people that I mentor. And then lastly, uh, what I think the MBA provided me was this entrepreneurial spirit, right? This ability to be able to touch many different parts of the business, ask questions and quickly access and quickly act, assess like the, the, the situation, right? And I remember when I was, uh, when I was studying for my GMAT and it was all about, uh, like what, you know, how do you ask the, what question, need, what question needs to be asked? And I'm like, why is this important? But when I look back on it, like, understanding and figuring out which questions to ask is the biggest piece of solving some of your difficult difficult problems. And so the MBA allowed me to be able to quickly assess um, what are some of the challenges, uh, allow me to pivot in different uh, careers and allow me to be able to network with people, you know, both both peers and also mentors along the way. How did you get from Otis to now Zipcar and in such a big role? So when I left Otis, uh, I got a call from a, uh, a, a recruiter at Zipcar. Um, it was actually not a Zipcar. It was a recruiter for Zipcar. Um, and so, you know, the conversation started as, hey, um, you know, we got a general manager role that we're kind of thinking about. And the current president was still in place. So they weren't able to really, you know, share a lot of the role. And I'm like, well, you know, it's been a long time since I become since I was a general manager. So uh, maybe I'll just put you in touch with one of my friends who's looking for a general manager job. They're like, no, this is a little bit more, a little bit more than a general manager job. And so, uh, so after signing an NBA, right, uh, we got a chance to dig into a little bit of what the role, uh, what the role was about, and and what they were looking for was an operational manager to come in and manage the entire business, right? So at Zipcar, right, we were found. We've been here for 24 years. We were founded in 2000 by two women in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And along the way, we've had really good, talented presidents. Many of them, at least the last few, had a te technological brain, right? They had, we got an app, you know, we had the digital experience. And so you had that piece of the business, which was, which is pretty solid, right? I mean, you think about it, we've been doing this for 24 years, uh, car sharing. The other side of the business was more operational, right? We own cars, we own up to 10,000 cars spread out throughout North America and, uh, and, and also uh, the UK. And so the operations side, particularly coming off of the pandemic, was the side that was challenging, right? High price of car parts, high price of insurance. And so they were looking for an operational minded person to come in and run Zipcar. And so I said, you know, I'm up for the challenge. Uh, I went from, I went from um, vertical transportation to horizontal transportation. And uh, believe it or not, some of the challenges were uh, were, were were very similar in nature. Um, and and I will tell you, at both companies, the people are magnificent and surrounded by people that really that you know the people at Zipcar, people that always really care about the product, really care about the inner cities and and building you know better sustainable uh, inner cities. And then lastly, uh, passionate about people and community. So I would say that's what really led me over to Zipcar was the was the passion for the product. Um, was the people and passion for the community, but also being able to kind of take my experience and expertise in operations and then apply it to the Zipcar brand. So you weren't looking to leave Otis. The recruiter found you and happened to entice you to, to jump? That is correct. Yeah, that is correct. That's awesome. Based on the experience that you had 
built up from J and J and Otis over the years. Yeah, they saw my uh, they saw my LinkedIn profile, and you know LinkedIn, you know I, I don't know they worked their magic and they saw my operational experience and how I navigated, particularly Otis at operations from a service manager running probably a small couple small routes um, all the way to um, a service center where I was running service parts, um, operations, engineering, and then also uh, the call center for all of Otis North America. So did the recruiter specifically mention that LinkedIn was where she found you? He, he mentioned that it was LinkedIn that really kind of, he, he was going to LinkedIn and saw my profile. So there is the value of LinkedIn and keeping your profile up to date and comprehensive because you can find a role like the one that you have now, president of Zipcar, because you keep, you kept it updated. Yeah, and that's that's true. So I've, I've made it a habit or I've tried to make it a habit every year at the end or the beginning of the year to really update my, my LinkedIn profile. Because otherwise you'll forget, right? You'll, you know, you'll say, oh, what did I do two, three years ago? What was that project? And I can't remember what I did, you know, like two weeks ago, let alone like what did I do two years ago in a job? Right. So uh, I try to keep it on LinkedIn. So if I ever have to go back, I can say, oh, I remember that project. Um, and so I try to keep that current. That's a great strategy to do it. Update it once a year. Now tell me about a struggle or a failure that you've experienced in your career and how you navigated it. Everybody loves a good struggle story. You've got to have that that struggle failure story in every uh, in every talk just because that's where you get your learnings. And so when I think of when I think of life, I don't think of struggles or failures. I think of I think of lessons and learnings. And so, you know, one learning that I had was really to be careful about who you bring in your inner circle. And so, uh, you know, coming on board, I had the opportunity really to to um, some of the people in my leadership team were actually there and they were in, you know, on a leadership team. And um, but within months, I had the opportunity to really bring a couple people onto my leadership team. And, and one major and obvious criteria for choosing who you want to be on your leadership team is really. Are they good at their job? You know, what's their role? What's their scope? And at the end of the day, those are table stakes. Those are must haves. You got to do that, right? My major learning is that just as important as the, the job, the scope, and whether or not that person could perform, the person must also have an enterprise view of the organization, right? And be able to sometimes have trade offs between you know, what's, you know, what's in it for them in that particular moment and what's better for the organization. And so in this particular case, I had selected one or two individuals, uh, onto the leadership team. And remember, this is, these are like sort of my personal closest confidants, uh, on the team. Um, and they performed very well. Their jobs, they performed very well, but they were first time leaders, right? And they turned out to be very selfish, turned out to be very immature and therefore didn't have more of an enterprise approach to how to solve problems or an enterprise of, uh, approach to like the organization. And so they really struggled. And not only did they struggle, but the leadership team struggled in embracing them onto the team. And so it took a while uh, for us to get beyond it. But we started out slowly out the gates because we had we had um, some team leaders, right, who were who were lacking an enterprise view. And so I would say it's important that as you choose your team, as you choose even employees, it's important that you that you take the time and you, you make the right choice because going too quickly could really set you uh, set you down a, a path, you know, for you know two or three months, two or three years that are that's hard to come back on. So, so what I'm hearing is hiring the right people is critical to the organization, not just to your team, but to the organization's goals and bringing on the right, the wrong person could cost you a lot of time and money. Being on the wrong person could definitely cost you a lot of time and money, but also it could be detrimental to some of the other strong players that you also have on the team. Yes, there are ripple effects in the culture as well. The other thing I heard was, I think oftentimes when managers are promoted into leadership roles, many of them do struggle with seeing the bigger picture and acting in support of the bigger picture. So a lot of the coaching clients that come to me they are now at an elevated role and they're having a harder time making that transition, thinking about a bigger scope than just their own function or role. And so that's that's a great thing that you need to look for um, for a leadership team. Absolutely. I would agree with that. So what are your superpowers, Angelo? You've probably got many, including jumping out of airplanes, but what else? 
So, so Susan, you've known me for a long time. So I would say, you, you know, there's there's two things that probably if you talk to uh, my friends, my colleagues, um, is I'm a people person and I'm a networker, right? And so those are the two things that come very easily to me. Uh, one of the things I say is that I was LinkedIn before LinkedIn, even before LinkedIn started. Uh, you know, people would say, hey, Angela, I'm looking to do this, looking to do that. And I could I could in my Rolodex, the brain of my Rolodex, so, you know, or back then I probably had an actual Rolodex. I would say, oh, talk to you know, talk to this person. Um, and so I really found that to be very valuable. And as I as I navigated sort of the corporate world, I, you know, I continued to hire people in the military or from the military. Also, um, when people are looking, I can say, hey, you want to go to you want to go to this business school? reach out to this person you want to go. And then I would also set people up. And so um, I think networking and being a people person is probably my number one, 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 one point five. Uh, and I would say the second thing, my superpower and really why I do what I do is really to bring people along for the ride. Right. My ultimate goal is to use my platform to be my platform as a successful executive in corporate America to improve the lives of people um, and to also improve the community. And I believe, I truly believe that you can do do all three. You can make profit, right? You can impact people, right? And you can improve communities. And and what I've done is along my way, I've always tried to incorporate all three. I call it the trifecta, right? And so I continue to recruit for military folks, whether it's telling them to go to, you know, a business school that I've gone to, whether it's hiring them for uh, the company that I'm at. So just this past uh, just this past Monday, we launched a collaboration of zip cars on Joint Base uh, Lewis McCord, which is a joint base of both Army and Air Force in Seattle. And so I was able to kind of take my military experience, coupled with my MBA, and and also coupled with my my military experience, and say, hey, you know what? Military soldiers need need car sharing, right? They need access to uh, to viable transportation um, that's affordable. And then lastly, I would say um, that shows sort of this um, this 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 community and this people aspect. And a week from now, which is uh, which is the week of Earth Week, um, we're actually going down. When I say we, I mean Zipcar. We're actually going down as a team to a um, a, a, a program called Ron Burton Training Village, and that we're going to be doing you know some work there around getting the summer camp ready for. For underprivileged kids, who will be coming in May, June time period. So my superpowers are networking, um, it's people, but it's also building community and building and impacting people. So that's what makes me who I am. Let's go to the lightning round. Quick answers to quick questions. All Give right. me your favorite book, podcast, or TV show or movie. My favorite book is John C. Maxwell's 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Back to the leadership theme. Two. What's the first app that you look at in the morning when you get up? I cannot tell a lie. The first app that I look at is Facebook. Oh uh, my god! I probably really? I, <laughs> remember I told you I'm people, people first, right? And so people and networking. And so I look at Facebook uh, and try to see what's going on in people's lives, and you know, uh, it'll 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 pop up. And sometimes I make a post on what I did or what my kids have done, what the family's done. So. Probably Facebook is the first one I open up before I open up my company email. Third question, a fun fact or something surprising about you? So uh, I think you've, you've mentioned it on this call already, but a fun fact about me is that I was a contestant on the Oprah's Big Give. Uh, so that happened actually while I was in business school. So add that on to the kids challenge, right? The, the Oprah's Big Give is a contestant. And then I would say the second thing uh, that's an interesting fact is that I used to jump out of airplanes, which also was mentioned. So combined, I'd say, uh, those are the two fun facts about me. Are you afraid of heights? I am actually. I, every day, every when I talk to people about jumping out of airplanes, I tell them every jump was a night jump because I jumped with my eyes closed. <laughs> what did that feel like? I'm terrified of heights. And so I just can't imagine someone being scared of heights jumping out of an airplane. Here's what I would tell you. After you do it a couple of times, it, it, it's muscle memory. Um, and what you don't want... Of the terror. Memory of terror. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 the stories that you hear of people when they don't jump and, and and they're still on the plane, it's worse than just jumping out the plane. And sometimes, you know, those Air Force guys like to take us for like fun rides, which are not very fun to us. And so uh, the the 
it, it, it's even better to jump because staying on the aircraft, you probably don't want to do that. So it was actually, it was, it was a great experience. After my first five jumps, I really uh, got five. They call it a five jump chump because in airborne school, you have to do five jumps in order to be qualified. And then after that, most people, if you, if you're going to jump again, you go to an airborne unit. So uh, I had a, I had a lot of fun. It's um, you're, you're jumping at wee hours of the morning, oftentimes two, three o'clock in the morning. You're just tired. You're just doing what you're told in this muscle memory. Do you feel like you're having a heart attack? Does your, does your stomach come up into your throat? That's what I imagine. What is that? No. like? No. So you're on a static line. So when you jump out, it's like you count the, you count 3,000, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Right. In most cases, 90% of the cases, your parachute opens. Right. And then it's like, oh, and then you just enjoy the ride on the way down. Um, and if not, then you pull your reserve parachute and then you're like, OK, once that opens up, now you're in a better spot. Uh, and then once you land, the, the worst part about the the uh, the jump is the landing, because it's not like skydiving where you land on your feet and you're attached to somebody's back. It's like you hit the ground. It's like, poof. Ugh. And then you like, Boom. yeah, you make sure like I still got my knees, my ankles, you know, I held everything tight. I, I'm still here. And then you say, OK, you wait there for like three or four seconds, make sure everything's good. And then you start moving on to the mission. So it's it's not bad. The, the jump is fairly, fairly quick. But the landing is like, oh, here it comes. How's the wind? Is this going to be uh, is this going to be a tough one? Is this going to be an easy one? And then uh, you get what you get. It's like it's like uh, like a box of chocolates. Oh my God, my hands are sweating just <laughs> listening to you talk about it. <laughs> I haven't even, not, not even going to do it. Okay, if you could go back and give your 20 year old something advice, what would it be? So, if I can go back and give my 20 year old self some advice, what I would say is that life is not linear, right? There's going to be some, there's going to be some curves, uh, but you got to take your lessons, learn from your mistakes, um, and then make sure that you are looking forward you know two three years for um for what to tackle next um but don't expect it to be i'm going i'm gonna go from here to there because there will be some pitfalls and the pitfalls is where your learnings come from and those learnings make you a better person or a better leader yeah you can't predict what life's going to throw at you different challenges oftentimes they're they're people related different people come into your life or different things happen with two people in your life or at work um, or it could be economy related and you can't control it. So there are things beyond your control. So you cannot assume that you're going to take the path that you think you're laying out. So what advice would you give to someone considering an MBA? So someone considering an MBA, I would say, take the time and think about fit. And when, you know, when people, when, when I was getting my MBA and looking for an MBA, people all like people said fit. And I went to MLT and they said, you want to go to a school that fits you. And you got all these rankings and all this other stuff. And I'm a military guy. So I'm like fit. I fit in a foxhole. I fit um, I fit underneath a, a tank. But I, I don't understand what this fit means. But really, it's a, uh, the MBA is, is, a, is a pricey education. And it's all about you. You're taking time off from work. And so you need to go to a place where the culture is a culture that you want to be a part of. Uh, somewhere where you can be present. And then I would say, lastly, somewhere where you can leave an impact, right? So you want to go to an MBA program that's going to be the fit for you. Impact, you enjoy the culture, and then, you know, ultimately you have a, ultimately you have a rewarding experience. That's great advice. I think fit is really um, an elusive concept for people who are thinking about the MBA. What does fit look like? Well, it's different for everyone, but you will you will get a sense of how schools are different as you talk to people, as you go visit. There are differences across the programs. There, there are definitely differences. And I'll, and I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, I heard fit. I didn't know what it meant. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was, it, it, I would not advise this, but um, so I actually didn't visit Michigan before business school okay. because I was in Korea. And so my uh -huh. wife visited Michigan and she went to GBR, okay? And what GBR is rendezvous, right? What's GBR that? is your acceptance, your acceptance students weekend. And so she went there. She had a great experience. And when she and when we talked about her experience and listen, we, we talked about many schools and she had gone with me on many visits. When we talked about her experiences, what she said was this school fits you. Now, she had no idea this whole fit thing. 
but like my wife knows me better than anybody. And she said, you know, this, this is the school for this school fits you. And when she said that, I was so, because I was like, I, I don't even know what fit is. She says it fits me. I guess I'm supposed to be here. And I would say looking back on it, she was right. Um, I, I was able to leave an impact. I was able to, um, to really delve down into education and network with people and get a great education. And then I, and now, now I'm actually helping to give back by mentoring, uh, but also, you know, give presentation and stuff like that back in Michigan. And Zipcar is also a partner with the University of Michigan. So again, that, that trifecta of people, um, of people, community and profit, right? Zipcar is a business. We're at, we're at Michigan. And then I'm also helping, um, Michigan alums and students uh, along the way. Thanks for spending time with me, Angelo. This was really great to hear about your career path, your decision making, and all of the impact that you're having on your kids, on your community, and on your business. Thanks so much. And uh, is there anything that you wish I would have asked you? Hey, Susan, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, this has been you know, a great experience being able to share my story with this community. Uh, the GMAT club community. So you asked me if there's anything that you didn't ask me. I would, I would say no, not necessarily, but here's what I would leave people with is that one is, um, you got to enjoy the ride, right? Part of this is about like having fun along the way and enjoying the ride. So I, I, I'd say, look, B school is going to be a challenge, right? But you, you can have fun in that challenge. You can meet new people. Um, and it's <clears throat> just going to be like corporate America as well, right? It's, it's going to be a challenge but you can also have fun along the way. The second thing I would say, and the last thing I will leave you with is make sure that you're pulling people up, right? So as you're climbing, you know, uh, I would say candidates or uh, members should, should be pulling people up. So, you know, I always try to find ways of mentoring and coaching uh, or giving back to my, my um, alma maters um, or even people that I've worked with in the past. So I would say those are the two things I'd like to leave this community with is enjoying your ride along the way and pulling people up as you go. Thanks so much for those bits of advice. I think that's something that can serve everybody throughout their business school decision as well as their careers.